Now this lecture is going to be a very brief introduction to mathematical modeling. Here we aim to explain what goes on in mathematical modeling and why we actually do it. And then finally we'll end with some examples to highlight the importance of math modeling in the real world. We start by asking what really is mathematical modeling? We offer a rather simple minded definition that is a representation in mathematical terms of the behavior of the real world or of real devices and real processes. We now take a rather elementary view of science. So what we do is we take the world and we break it up into two bits. One is the real world and the other is the conceptual world and we go ahead and divide it into two different worlds. In the real world is where we observe phenomena and in the conceptual world we conduct experiments and devise models both of which feed into predictions. The central idea is to try and work out what on earth is really going on in the real world. That's the central idea. So we'll highlight the real world. Now as this is really central to the modeling process, we go ahead and highlight it. In the modeling process, it is rather important to go from the real world to the conceptual world and then back from the conceptual world to the real world. Now, within the conceptual world, insights from experiments should inform models and inferences from models should guide experiments. Now, let us consider math modeling and engineering. Now, what we find is that engineers are typically interested in designing devices and systems and to that end design turns out to be a rather important and key feature of engineering. Let us now look at the basic process of modeling. We always start with a real world problem then construct a model which is then subjected to analysis and finally it all feeds into design. So we go to and fro between the real world and the final design. In getting to the model we need to simplify the real world and the objective of the analysis is to allow us to make inferences. The iterative process between the real world and the final design is important as it is the only way that models can be improved and validated. A few comments are in order. Now initially it is very difficult to know what really to include in the model. So if you happen to be a research student and are struggling with formulating a good initial model, rest assured there are lots of others who will be in the very same boat. But if the model is chosen very carefully, we can then understand the real world rather quickly. Now, the reason we devise models is because we want guidelines about how a system should be designed, built, or operated. However, the model is only really useful if we can translate the modeling conclusions and the inferences into real world predictions. Now let's look at the process of modeling in some more detail. We would actually start with the real world at one end and with the mathematical model at the other end. And of course while we connect the real world to the model we would need to make some simplifications to the real world along the way. 
And of course, the model has to be connected all the way back into the real world. We would start with mathematical analysis, followed by computations slash numerical analysis, conduct simple simulations, and then move on to more detailed simulations, then try and conduct some very simple test bed experiments before moving on to real world experiments and finally implementation in the real world. It is really useful to keep going between the different levels of detail. That way we can understand which parts of the system are important and perhaps which parts can be left out. The above diagram was adapted from the performance modeling notes of Lehman Wishik. Now we get on to the question on why we actually do mathematical modeling or in other words what really is mathematical modeling good for? Well one key reason is predicting system behavior. Now we'd like to know whether we can still observe some real-world behavior when we create a simplified model of the system even after leaving out certain real-world properties. We'd like to know whether we could predict system behavior even when it becomes too large to simulate. Modeling turns out to be a quick way to get insight into emergent behavior. Another important reason is the design of new products. For example, most systems have a lot of parameters. Can we understand which of these parameters really matter in the system. Modeling can also suggest where problems in fact are most likely to occur. We can then actually confirm this with simulations and or experiments. In fact, we can also avoid or fix these problems with the help of modeling. We can also understand the various trade-offs that may impact design options. We can also understand performance limits. before the product is actually built. And finally, we can understand whether the system or the product is achieving what we really want it to achieve. With all this talk of modeling, we should also be asking, is there such a thing as a correct model? The short answer is not really. Now we have to be crystal clear on the purpose of the model. Different models are useful for different purposes and different purposes in fact need different models. There can be different types of models. Some merely help to describe observed behavior. Others help to explain why the behavior occurred in the first place. We have models that would allow us to predict future behavior. 
And of course, we could also have models which are used to persuade other people of your point of view. I remember I said that going between the real world and the model can actually be quite hard. So we now offer some pointers on how to cope with this part of the modeling process. First, always construct simple models from simple assumptions. This will lead to models that are mathematically tractable. And it does not really matter if initially the model does not fully represent the real world. The mathematical analysis will in fact help develop some insight and one should always check that insight with simulations. After this part we should refine the models with enhanced assumptions. Of course, this will make the models more realistic. And one should repeat the analysis, the computations, simulations and the experiments till we have satisfied the purpose of the model. And now for some words of caution. Always be aware of the limitations of your model. The limitations are often based on the underlying assumptions that you make. And always remember that models are only abstractions of the real world. And if the behavior that is predicted by the model does not reflect what we see or measure in the real world, then it's time for you to revisit the model. Now let's talk about some real life examples and liven this lecture. The first example will be the beautiful Millennium Bridge which is in London. It is a bridge for people to cross the River Thames. That's the picture of the bridge. It's a nice, beautiful bridge which opened on the 10th of June 2000. And then something rather dramatic happened. The bridge closed within two days of it opening. Essentially what happened was that unexpected lateral vibrations forced the bridge to be closed. Now what really happened was that the natural sway of motion of people walking caused small lateral oscillations in the bridge. This in turn caused all the people on the bridge to sway in step and which in turn increased the amplitude of the bridge oscillations. Now these vibrational modes had in fact not been anticipated during the design of the bridge. After extensive analysis, the following solution was proposed. The retrofitting of 37 fluid viscous dampers to control horizontal movement and 52 mass dampers to control vertical movement. The bridge opened again on the 22nd of February 2002, almost two years later. All has been well since with the bridge, but Londoners still rather affectionately call it the Wobbly Bridge. The bridge was also featured in the very famous movie 
Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince in 2009. Now in the movie, the bridge actually famously collapses after an attack by the notorious Death Eaters. Now let's look at another real life example. This is an example that we use almost every day of our lives. It's PageRank. PageRank was the first algorithm that was used by Google search to rank websites. Now how it works is roughly as follows. The algorithm counts the number and quality of the links to a page to get some idea of how important the website actually is. The underlying assumption is that the more important websites are likely to receive more links from other websites. Now in the diagram above, let's highlight the underlying principle. The size of each circle is proportional to the total size of the other circles which are pointing to it. So essentially, if the circles represent websites, then larger the circle, the larger the page rank. Now this turns out to be an absolutely excellent example of modeling. The models were constructed, analysis was done, prototypes developed and taken on to the real world. Based on this work, Google was founded in 1998 and life has not really been the same since. So hopefully this video has managed to um, give you at least some insight into what mathematical modeling is, why one should really be doing it in the first place and how it can truly have a tremendous impact in our daily lives.